Hello, I'm Eric Kosky. I've invited my friends Greg Talley and Ryan Smith to join me in ingesting fun and bizarre foods. We'd like you to join us too. So come in and open up. It's Junk Mouth. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm Greg. Hey, I'm Ryan. Uh, welcome, listeners, to the Roof Lizard Lounge, high atop the Dino Hotel in picturesque Lakewood, Colorado, above our restaurant Paleo Joe's, and just a short drive from Denver and the Rocky Mountains. Let's get started with our lunch swap. Uh, Greg, what did you bring in your lunch today? Yes, in my platinum-plated three-level Mumbai tiffin. Oh, God, it's I, platinum now? It's platinum. Ah, uh, no, mere plebeian. Uh, that make silver it or gold. Heavy? Uh, no, it's it's wonderfully light. I have a variety of decadent foodstuffs in here, Ryan. Uh, on the top tier, our appetizer is a light schmear of scrambled tuatara eggs on a bagel made from an ancient grain recovered from the Neolithic grindstones of Katal Hoyuk. On the middle level is a Vancouver, British Columbia Dougie Dog, a gourmet bratwurst suffused with 100-year-old Louis the uh, 13th cognac and topped with fresh lobster, picante sauce, and Kobe beef seared in olive and truffle oil. And in the bottom tier is a Tahitian vanilla bean ice cream with specks of Amade porcelana, the most expensive chocolate in the world, delicately leafed in 24 karat edible gold, gold dragnets, and lightly dusted with beluga sturgeon caviar. That sounds vile. Uh, uh, it actually sounds slightly less sickening and immoral than normal. Uh, uh, the, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Okay, ice cream dusted with fish eggs. Uh, yes, and by the way, this is a real dish. This is considered the most... I don't e- doubt it. It's yeah. the most expensive Sunday in the world, and I happen to have one uh, packed in dry ice in my uh, platinum-plated Mumbai Tiffin. Yeah, I just I don't get the, the edible 24-karat gold thing you see in those really expensive <laughs> dishes. I'm going to eat the world's most valuable metal because fuck the cooks who made this for me. You know, <laughs> fuck poor people. It's, it's, it's all about visual presentation it's, when people do that, and it's a total waste of money. But you know what? I think it's time for me to open up my HR Puffin Stuff Lunchbox. Oh, yeah, it looks like uh, we got some uh, advertisement in here today because I have uh, Oscar Mayer bologna with Kraft American cheese and best food mayonnaise on Wonder Bread uh, to drink Kool-Aid brand lemonade, and for dessert, uh, little Debbie Donut Sticks. Uh, looks like we're really making a push for sponsors this week. Hey, little Debbie Donut Sticks are, those are like a fucking food of the gods. Well, I mean, they're wonderful. I mean, we really like Little Debbie. Them. And if Little Debbie wants to help add to our sponsorship on this program, we would welcome them with open arms <laughs> yeah. and their delicious foodstuffs. So, um, they make a great product, <laughs> Little Debbie. They do. Um, speaking of uh, products, Ryan, what did you bring for lunch today? Uh, I've got a used relish packet wadded up in a napkin. I hate relish. Yeah, we know. That's why we <laughs> like to bring a lot of it on the show. Uh, so uh, now welcome everyone to our Wizards episode of Junk Mouth. Uh, Greg, why don't you tell us a little bit about what this episode is going to cover? Well, sure. Let me wave my magic wand here. Yeah, that's illegal in most states and the District of Columbia, you pervert. Uh, Not that wand, this wand. Yeah, I'm looking at it. With the wave of my wand, I say the magic words, Revilio show upicus delicious food stuffium. That's not Latin. Don't be silly, that's wizard talk. That's gibberish. You can't add bogus suffixes to the end of English cognates and turn them into a magic spell. Poof, Ryan is a toad. You really are a child. That's not even a wand. That's an old chewed up Capri Sunstraw. All right, right, guys, knock it off. You're derailing this podcast faster than an angry troll on the Hogwarts Express line. Well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. Uh, I recently traveled to Los Angeles and visited the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal Studios Hollywood, the entertainment capital of L.A., And while there, Headmaster Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall were kind enough to issue me a day pass to Hogsmeade. Jesus. So I visited Honeyduke's sweet shop and brought back a ton of wizard food. So more on this in a few. 
You scare me, Craig. But now it's time to let everyone know Junk Mouth is part of the Dino Hotel Entertainment Network of America, or DINA. We encourage you to check out our other podcasts. Our flagship program, Mystery Science Theater 3000 Revival League, hosted by Greg, Ryan, and Kate Page. And also, 10 Backward, where our friends Ron and James watch Star Trek The Next Generation in reverse order. Uh, now, let me wave my magic wand. That's a chopstick. God damn it. Chopsticks are great. And uh, now let me say the special incantatum. Expecto Corporate Sponsorship Sorium. And hey, presto digitorium. We need to sing for our supper and conjure up that sweet Kevin Murphy jingle. Poof, hey, presto, roll the tape. The next time you travel to Denver, make your journey into one that you'll remember. Don't just sit around and wish when you can have an expedition at the Dino Hotel. Stretch, snarl, growl. Oh. Both children, you know that? You are both children. Holy God. What what point is there in being an adult if you can't act like a child sometimes? Yes, the childlike wonder. I don't know, being able to drive and vote? Yes. Yes, we can do that. It didn't stop the, the Potters from, from uh, Harry Potter drove, and uh, he didn't vote, but he, he did uh, drive a Ford Anglia. Wait, he didn't vote? He, he, he lives in a liberal democracy. Well, that depends on if Voldemort's in charge or not. He lives in England. Well, but he lives. I in mean, granted, that. it's post-Brexit England, and that sucks, but it's still England. But he lives in the magical wizarding world of England. There's no such place, Greg. There is no magic. There are no wizards. Eric, you guys are like a ro- rogue bludgers in a Quidditch match. Knock it off. Let's fuck get is a bludger. Uh, a bludger is uh, what you use to smack down uh, the gatekeeper uh, when uh, they are busy trying to block the quaffle. Uh, the fuck is while, a quaffle? Well, while the uh, the, the uh, Harry Potter uh, tries to catch the snitch. That. I don't even know what that is. Let, that's, all right. because you know, you're, that's because it you, sounds you don't obscenely read. sexual. You don't. All right. Read. All right. You, you know what? Read. We don't. We don't. I, need... I don't read. Let's get this thing back on track. Before we dig in our food, let's lay out our ground rules. Okay. Rule one: We look for items not widely distributed in the USA. Uh, I think the magical spark parts of Scotland are, are still okay, though. Uh, rule two. Our foods need to be unique or regional foods. We're not just looking for a local brand of something you can get anywhere. Uh, three, we fit each week's foods to a theme, uh, this this theme being particularly magical. Yeah. And uh, rule four, each week we get a pass card in case there's a particular incantatum we just can't get out of our mouth. Uh, and so this week, uh, as we look at our favorites of witchers, witches and wizards everywhere, Greg has prepared us, prepared us a gigantic feast, big enough for a grop. So, uh, Greg, what are we starting out with? Well, I, I thought about this, and I was figuring out what should I serve you that would be savory. I mean, should it be the maggoty haggis served at nearly Headless Nick's death day party? Maybe, I like that. Yeah, or maybe Hagrid's rock cakes and stoat sandwiches. But I finally settled on going with uh, just a good old-fashioned house elf prepared shepherd's pie with chips and malt vinegar. Now, I had to go to a muggle eatery for this, so I went to Baker Street Pub and Grill uh, and got their shepherd's pie uh, to stand in for the house elves. And um, Ryan, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of shepherd's pie? Uh, well, shepherd's pie, uh, which is uh, actually made with minced lamb or mutton uh, traditionally. I think I've only had it in the States with, like, beef. Uh, uh, cottage pie is actually made with beef. It's basically a meat pie with a crust of mashed potato instead of pastry. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's shepherd's pie is one of those things that varies widely depending on basically who's making it a lot of people call a lot of different things shepherd's pie uh, but the the defining ingredients are sort of ground meat mixed with vegetables and topped uh, with potatoes um, and 
yeah, the term cottage pie, which is the beef pie, which is what I think really, but would you agree most Americans see shepherd's pie as, as a beef pie? Yeah, very, I mean, we're not a big lamb-eating country anyway outside of cer- certain ethnic enclaves. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I come from uh, uh, an area in Kentucky. It's really only limited to Davis County where we barbecue lamb, uh, barbecue mutton. Uh, but outside of it, I've very rarely seen lamb. You're right. But uh, cottage pie, that was used by 1791. Uh, which is when the potato was just being introduced, believe it or not, as an edible crop affordable for the poor. So basically, cottage pie was a way to say poor people food. Uh, the term shepherd's pie, that didn't show up until 1854. Uh, and like I said, it's it's sometimes synonymous with uh, cottage pie here in the States. But in the UK, shepherd's pie is is pretty much exclusively lamb. If, if you've had a shepherd's pie with lamb, I think they're far superior. Uh just, just my personal taste. I, I, I like lamb if if prepared right. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. I think particularly in this dish, especially if I know oh. it suffered. I will say, Greg, uh, do you know uh, Baker Street prepares their shepherd's pie with what meat? Uh, beef. It it's is beef. beef. Okay. It is beef, and um, it, this, uh, by the way, uh, they Harry has for dinner uh, in the Grand Hall. Uh, at Hogwarts in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets and also in Order of the Phoenix, the house elves prepare um, shepherd's pie a couple of times. It's just, it's classic British food in either the muggle world or the magical world. So let's open up our containers and uh, let's try this. And, and then we'll also pass around the malt vinegar. Yeah, right. And you've got some, the, uh, the malt vinegar there. Malt vinegar and chips. There you go. Uh, you, you passing on the malt vinegar? Uh, I'll give it a whirl in a corner here. Okay, I'm tasting mashed potatoes. And... Ground beef, carrots, peas, cheese. I think there's a tomato in here. This is really savory and wonderful. Yeah. Now what? that I'm finished with dousing mine in malt vinegar, because I love that, uh-huh. let me take a bite. Did you douse the uh, the shepherd's pie in malt vinegar too? Or I the... did because mm, I'm, that, I'm just that way. Um. Basically, this is a good food ruined by the, all the stuff in it, I think. Uh, I, I do not like carrots and peas, so basically that ruins this for me, but I'm biased because that's those are two vegetables that just really turn me off to anything, you know? If not for them, I think I would really like this. Uh, but uh, as it is, there's just too, sort of too carroty a flavor to the beef. No, I'm a big fan of the vegetables, and so me too. To me, th- this is actually. Oh, well, that's why I say I'm biased. Yeah, so yeah. I, I recognize my bias. No, I I think outside of, you know, I, outside of having lamb, which would I think take this up to being just over the top. Otherwise, this is absolutely uh, well well done. Uh, the potatoes are have that nice golden crispy brown on top that. Uh, yeah, I think it's something a, you're always looking for in a shepherd's pie. It's a good looking food. No. It I is. Mean, it's just like I said, the carrots and the peas sort of infuse the beef with a little too much of their flavor for me because those are just two vegetables that have always, especially peas, just really turned me off. They're, uh, the, the, the peas are one of those things where uh, I don't know if it's genetic. Like uh, some people, I guess, actually either lack or have a specific genetic trait that makes them – despise broccoli and nothing you can do will change that. It's actually in some cases genetic. Uh, I don't know if it's genetic with the peas in me, but they just they make me ill. So no. um, I would give this five greasy wrappers because it's hot, it's savory, there's nothing better than meat and vegetables and a gravy with mashed potatoes. Having the broiled cheese over the top. Peas in the Middle East would be better, Greg. Uh, I, I I don't know. If you ask me uh, whether I could have a shepherd's pie or a piece in the Middle East, you know, I I, I would be hard pressed. But um, what do, what do you guys? Uh, so I'm giving. I'm gonna rate these separately. I yeah, the rate five. the shepherd's pie five greasy wrappers out of five. Mm-hmm. Um, what about these classic British chips or French fries and malt vinegar, which is the way you would eat them in Britain? I need to grab a little malt vinegar to sure sprinkle. Mm-hmm. Eric, what do you think? Oh, I think the the fries really uh, they're they're just that right thickness where they're fairly thick but not not overly like steak fry thick uh, that they really have enough to absorb that malt oh, that's vinegar. A strong vinegar smell to that, I'll tell you that. Um, Which I'm, makes sense being that it's vinegar. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of the malt vinegar, um, and I I think this is uh, 
So the fries, yeah, I, I'll, I'll give the fries a straight up a five greasy wrappers. Um, and then I think I'm a little biased on the shepherd's pie because I've had good shepherd's pie made with the ground lamb, mm-hmm. which I distinctly prefer. And that's the only thing I could really see as something that could improve this. Mm-hmm. But it's enough I have to go four and a half greasy wrappers on it. I can't quite give it a five because I know with lamb this would be even better. I'm torn. Uh, for one thing, uh, the vinegar on the fries is not my my jam. It's all right. It's a three. But I'm not a big fan of vinegar generally. I consider it a cleaning fluid and not a food. Um, but uh, uh, I'm sort of torn on the shepherd's pie because I think without the peas in there, I'd probably give it a five. With the peas, it's inedible. <laughs> So I might have to give it, I mean, is it possible for me just based upon the fact that I know that objectively this is a good food and it's just my bias against peas that ruins it for me? Is it, is it possible for me to give it sort of a uh, uh, an honorary five? You, you can do that. Sure. You yeah. can do whatever you want. We can't stop you from no. that. I would give this an honorary five because I recognize that it's my bias against peas that is ruining this for me. And... Uh, Greg, I only took one small bite out of the corner of this. Uh, dinner for me tonight. Dinner for you tonight. I Excellent. Might, I might keep munching on the fries, though, because I haven't had breakfast. Well, Americans... Ow, when, when, I, when, I ate my own thumb. Well, then it must be good. <laughs> <laughs> just feeding a fry into my mouth, and I just kept on going. And, and I was waving my magic wand quietly under the table to make Ryan bite himself while he eats. Now, the um, Americans eat chips or french fries... Usually we go the sweet, salty route. You know, we douse it in salt, and then we eat it with a sweet ketchup. The Brits cut the potato flavor with an acid, uh, you know, the strong bite of the vinegar. And I got to say, I like the British um, acid uh, route better than the the sweet, maybe because it's unusual, because I don't normally put malt vinegar on my, my fries. But, you know, but... Malt vinegar and chips. Uh, I'm gonna give it a four and a half. I think it could be a five. The we we it had to port this from the English pub from Baker Street Pub over uh, to the studio. It took about thirty minutes, so the fries are slightly mushy. They would be incredible if they were crispy. Um, and and right on the plate. They're still right. warm enough that they're pretty good, though. Yeah, yeah, they're still good. They're still good, but the cold fries are just. I mean, that's a war crime. But warm, mm-hmm. as long as they're warm, they're yeah. generally pretty good. I, I will say, I accounted for that when I gave the fries a five. That that that. Yeah. I uh, did. I already rate the fries. No. No. Uh, I like I said, vinegar's not my my jam, so I, I'm going to have to go a three on this. I don't like vinegar on fries. It's all right. It's not sickening by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, like I said, I'm just I, I consider vinegar a cleaning fluid or the base for a marinade, not a, a, a condiment in and of itself. Uh, so uh, you know, you, you use vinegar as a base for a marinade to marinate a steak. Great. Use it to clean your mirror. Great. But uh, don't don't shake it over fries. So uh, I'm gonna have to go three, I guess, because it's okay. But that's that's as far as I can say. That that sounds fair to me. I'm picking out on mashed gonna, potatoes. I can't okay. get enough of this. I would I would love to, but unfortunately, I need to move on. So I'm going to have to move mine to the side here. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, Greg, where do you want to put but, these? Uh, let's stack yeah. them up over here where yeah. there's a little more room. Let's let's keep track of them because I am finishing that when uh, we break. We were uh, <laughs> yours is in the middle there, Eric. Mine's Excellent. on the bottom. Ryan's on the top. Uh, mine is yours, Greg. Just take it. I'm I'm always in the middle between we, these two. If we so. were professional, we would edit this out. But yeah. <laughs> You, yeah, you edit the podcast, Ryan. If if it's still in, you know Ryan got lazy. Yeah. So, all right. Now, uh, for our audience, you can send us an owl post. If masticating on this show makes you want to spit up an owl pellet at us oh, for Jesus a future Christ. audience regurgitation segment, you clearly do not understand how the digestive system works. But regardless, <laughs> here's how you can contact us. Email junkmouthpodcast at gmail.com. On Facebook at facebook.com slash junkmouth or on Twitter, at JunkMouthPod. All right, now, let's go on to accentuate the positive. This is where I get to highlight one of the many joyful things in life that make it great to be alive. And this week, I'm tackling the occult and misunderstood world, alchemy. Alchemy? Seriously? Yeah, it's an important medieval precursor to the world's modern chemistry and natural philosophy. Um, yeah, yeah, not not like people who still follow alchemy. I'm talking ancient alchemy. All right, yeah, I, I buy that. Okay. Yeah, 
Alchemy actually got its start in ancient Egypt, uh, where the word chem was used for this study in reference to the fertility of the plains around the Nile and the Egyptian belief in life after death and the mummification procedures they performed. These probably gave rise to some of the rudimentary chemical knowledge, uh, though at the time it was set with the goal of immortality. Yeah. Um, and it got further progressed then as the Greeks got a hold of this knowledge and they came up with the concept that the world had thing, things that made up all the stuff around us where they believed it was four elements instead of the whole periodic table full of elements we know now mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, they said, fire, earth, air, and water. Uh, but at least they, they had some of the right track. There were some concepts there that came out that yeah. were good. Um, and Those goddamn Platonists hadn't gotten there. We might be a lot further on than yeah. we are right now, thanks to the early Greek scientists. Yeah. Now, and, and Fuck these, you, Plato. Sorry. <laughs> these, these Greeks that then used the word for their study um, as chemia, which was the Greek word for Egypt. And huh. later in the 7th century then, the Arabs came in and occupied Egypt uh, and had some got into some of this study, and they put the word al before it. That's basically alchemia. Uh, yeah, it... it Essentially is, and but when they said alchemia, um, and, and to the Arabs that means the black land, because mm. of the fertileness uh, of the Nile soil, right? Uh, and this is largely believed to be the origin of the word alchemy. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of it's, you, you're constantly shocked by the number of words the Arabs gave us. Pretty much anything with al in front of it: alcohol, algebra, hey, Al Gore, <laughs> and and. At least most of those are excellent things to have. <laughs> well, algebra, not so much. Hmm. Yeah, well, we'll leave the uh, actual dichotomy of which of those are good and not to, to the listeners. <laughs> uh, so we then see the Arabs bringing uh, this alchemy to Spain uh, from the point to which it spread out to the rest of Europe. Uh, when was that? Uh, that would be in the 8th century. Oh, okay. So we're still. I mean, the, well, the, yeah. the Spanish were not ejected from Spain until 1492. The Spanish yeah. were never ejected. I mean, from the Spain. Uh, the Arabs were not uh, ejected from Spain until. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. So they, I said they, it they lasted a long, good, long time. Which yes. is a, it's a good thing they did because Europe was basically just a bunch of people shitting in holes and hiding in caves until the Arabs basically took over Spain and gave Europeans science. Yeah, and, and algebra and the concept of zero. <laughs> and, and at which point Modern their, their desire to rule over other people led to the Industrial Revolution where they, uh, you know, enslaved, virtually enslaved labor to uh, get them to uh, make them richer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, Europe has some sins to pay for. I'm just saying yeah. that, uh, that uh, the Western world would still be hiding in caves if not for the, uh, the Moorish conquest of Spain. I, oh, I wasn't arguing. I was just elaborating. <laughs> uh, so what what I do want to get into now, what happened uh, was then all these studies of chemicals uh, fit in with the Arabian belief that was developed that all metals were made up of mercury and sulfur in varying proportions. Thankfully, we've learned that's not true because, <laughs> you know, those are great things for you to work with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this gold. is why early scientists were all insane people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so, they, but they did see gold as the perfect metal, and any other metal was less perfect, um, at least according to Western alchemists. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the idea was that they wanted to come up with a way to transmute these other metals into gold, which by their philosophical beliefs, they, they believed there was something called a philosopher's stone that could do this. Uh, and also the possessor of the uh, Philosopher's Stone would then gain immortality. Um, and, and shortly after these beliefs developed, alchemy really broke into two camps. Uh, one really was focused on the studying of what happens in all these reactions. Mm -hmm. And their work really led into a lot of what we consider modern chemistry. Yeah. Uh, and had a big influence into the scientific method. It was really going down that route. The other side of it really wanted to focus on the spirituality and metaphysical side of these things with the goal of the immortality. Um, and most of these people eventually became pseudoscientists and crackpots. Isaac Newton. Uh, yeah, Isaac yeah, Newton. Yeah, yeah. He big, big into it. Yeah, because yeah, his study was all about immortality. Yeah. It's... Uh, <laughs> 
Just amazing uh, the guy had such a fine scientific mind, except there. he's just alchemist for his entire life, basically. But, but he never things, gave up on it. But things yeah. were not as finely divided as well, that's true. Today. I mean, you know, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, it wasn't Huygens. The uh, uh, Johann Kepler. Was it Kepler who was sort of the last scientific astrologer? He was convinced that the orbits had something to do with platonic solids because his astrological philosophy told him they should. Um, I'm not familiar with Kepler enough to know that, but, but you know, it, it took a while to separate out ancient and medieval superstition and religion and the occult from what eventually became what we would know as pure sciences today. Yeah, well, also it, it took a long time to uh, to overcome the influence of Aristotle, too, because he was basically just considered to have known everything and when, in fact, he was wrong about almost everything. <laughs> but it's uh, You'd be hard-pressed to find a, a place where Aristotle was right when he made a scientific pronouncement because it just sounded good to him. But, but yeah. n- modern chemistry, natural philosophy, scientific method... Um all, um, all of these things had to go through sort of an alchemical process of their own and get purified out from the waffle and, and the twaddle and, and oh, absolutely. The, the, the occult nonsense. That is an interesting way to describe that, Greg. Yeah. And on that note, Ryan, why don't you uh, go on to your segment and give us something a little more coherent than what Greg just said. Okay, uh, you know what? Uh, this week, I'm not even going to go into anything uh, uh, controversial, although I think there would be some controversy among some people. These people are idiots. Uh, magical thinking. The logical fallacy of uh, believing that correlation equals causation. Uh, you see this a lot in the alternative medicine sphere today. Uh, you see it a lot today. I mean, magical thinking can be as something as simple as I'm just going to do something else and hope everything else hope everything works out when you have a problem. You know that's magical thinking. Uh, but the idea that correlation equals causation uh, is it's easy to fall into. You see something happen, event A happens, and then event B happens. Therefore, A caused B. That's not necessarily true. There's a a great um, website. And uh, you know, the, uh, I think the big think has has thrown up a few of their their graphs that basically makes graphs that correlate completely random events like the release of Nicolas Cage movies, uh, graphed against the number of children who drown in swimming pools. And if you look at the graph, there seems to be a ca- causation. Nicolas Cage releases a movie, and children die. One, one of the most famous, I think, is the sale of ice cream and murders. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They have nothing to do with each other. Now, you know what? There is an increase uh, with Nicolas Cage movies, and that's bees! <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, the, you know, the idea that correlation equals causation, it's easy to fall into. It is one of the classic logical fallacies. The most famous, of course, is never get involved in a land war in Asia. But only slightly less well-known is this. Correlation does not equal causation. Look, there's a lot of magical thinking in the world. Uh, the, 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 the classic type you think of... Uh, is primitive folk religion. You know, the last time we slaughtered a goat on a Wednesday, the drought ended. Or the last time a virgin fell into a volcano, we had a great harvest. So we got to keep slaughtering goats and throwing virgins into volcanoes uh, in order to make sure those things keep happening. Oh, yeah, but, okay, those were primitive pre-industrial neophyte agrarian societies. Yeah, and look, they, they weren't stupid assumptions to make five or 10,000 years ago. Noticing the correlation and developing a plan was... Uh, Actually, pretty nimble and sophisticated reasoning. But today we have the scientific method, goddammit. You don't just throw virgins into volcanoes willy-nilly and hope it works out. Well, of course not. I mean, I'd like to think that we're a little more enlightened What you than need the- is a well-designed experiment where you cultivate one field and throw virgins into a volcano before harvest time, while cultivating an identical field with no propitiatory acts toward the gods. Then over a number of years, track the harvests from each field to see how good they are. You're... St- Still burning virgins alive in molten lava. Oh, yeah. Dozens or hundreds of them. Uh, this would be a years-long experiment, and you'd want to try different combinations of virgins at different times throughout the growing season. So you'd end up sacrificing even more virgins than in the primitive society, well, even yeah. more than before. Yeah, but this time they're providing data. It's an actual controlled experiment. And at the end of it, if there's no appreciable difference between the crop yields, well, then we know we don't have to murder virgins with lava anymore. Uh, we already know that, Ryan. Do we? I mean, have we ever actually run that experiment? No, no, we have not. And you're right. 
I, I guess we need to sacrifice virgins. Yeah, sacrifice them to science. That's my point. Don't believe anything without experimental confirmation. Ryan out. I can't huh? argue with your logic, but I can argue with your ethics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Greg, you anti-scientific ethical person, you. Oh, man. Now, Greg, look, I what's le- what is more ethical? Allowing an entire village to starve or throwing a few dozen virgins into a volcano? If I- it turns out that volcanic virgin sacrifice is necessary for a good harvest. We live in the space age and the atomic age. Can't we just get back to bombing virgins on the Bikini Atoll? (laughs) (laughs) You know, that's what progress demands. Ah, so bombing virgins might increase crop yields. I think we have to expand this experiment. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I'd like to expand it because, you know, we're trying virgins out here, but how do we know that it's not just... People, we need another volcano where we throw people that who who have had sex. Are, are you saying a control volcano? Well, the control volcano is is obviously the volcano you don't throw any virgins into. The the field that is just left alone and and tilled identically, but there's no sacrifice. But you need three volcanoes besides the control. You need one for virgins. You need one for people who have had sex, and you need one for just random people. You know, a random assortment of virgins and sexually active people, because who knows? It could just be humans. Uh, so you're saying there could be a placebo effect exactly, yeah, yeah, on who gets thrown into the volcanoes. Or virgins might not even be the most effective. That uh, might just be the first ones they try. Okay, throwing throwing ethics aside here, um, one of the biggest problems with, with your uh, volcanology here is you would have to find three near identical volcanoes with the same chemical composition. And uh, there, there are almost no two identical volcanoes what if, in the world. What if we took an isle, a volcanic island and actually put the fields in, in quadrants around it? We could go that route. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. But I think you'd be better going the atomic route because you could control the nature of the atomic bomb exactly. dropped on the atoll better than you uh, you might end up with giant radioactive lizards. But the lizards. volcano might be a necessary component, too. I mean, we're, we're trying to eliminate variables. If we can eliminate the volcano as a variable and it's just murdering virgins, then we can do it any way we want. Well, your solution is more green. I will give you that. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, if you drop a, a, an atomic bomb on the island, the, the crop yields aren't going to be great anyway. <laughs> true. So that there, How there, do we know that? You could end That's up, true. You could end up with like six foot ears of corn. Well, I mean, there was that uh, old Peter Graves episode of Mystery Science Theater where they irradiated, accidentally irradiated grasshoppers because they were creating giant atomic tomatoes. <laughs> But if we do create six foot ears of corn, uh, then I think we will have made great progress towards solving world hunger. Yeah, or just yeah. something really cool to look at. I mean, and how do you know? Why that, do they have to be exclusive? How do you know that uh, it's not appeasing any gods and it's just plugging the hole? Well, I mean, they're going to vaporize before they do that. Okay, well, it's assuming depending on which kind of volcano it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, if if it's a Kilauea style volcano with or you know it it, it or a Stromboli volcano, there'll be a lot of lava, and they'll go up and smoke quickly. Oh well, yeah, I mean, they, you know, you're. But assuming. if it's a pyroclastic flow volcano, I mean, well, I mean, they they technically they could end up like in a Pompeii situation. Yeah. <laughs> so we we have to think this through. I think we need to crunch the numbers some more. Absolutely. I, I, let's let's. Take that offline and finish it. The, the point is, we're going to have to kill a lot of virgins with lava. Yes, let's. Let, we'll figure it out offline. Right now, I think we need to move on to our drink segment. Uh, Greg, uh, what did you bring us uh, from the Great Wizarding World to quench our thirst? Well, um, basically, um, I when I one of the main features of the Harry Potter world is butter beer. And uh, I got to try what Universal Studios is calling butterbeer, and you can get it in frozen or regular. And um, you can't get that uh, outside of the theme parks. So we're trying, uh, from Reed's Ginger Ale, we're going to try a knockoff product called the Flying Cauldron uh, Butterscotch Beer. Now, let's, uh, let's remember that I, it wasn't the same brand, was it? But we tried a knockoff Butterscotch. This is it. This is it. I mean, how many Butterbeer knockoffs are this? We tried it on the Mystery Science Theater podcast, but for the sake of this, we're bringing it back. Oh, well, fuck you. So I don't remember that being very good. <laughs> well, while while I uh, play the soda rista and grab them out of the cooler, Ryan, why don't you read this uh, giggle potion recipe and read just from there about the flying cauldron soda? 
since 1374, the Flying Cauldron has been making this magical brew for underage wizards and wizards who are young at heart at their brew pub in Hogsbreath, England. You skipped down well below where Craig was asking you to read. He wanted you to talk about one ice-cold bottle of our butterscotch beer and one scoop of premium vanilla ice cream. Okay, well, you just said that. The point is that this uh, little, since A, since 1370, no, you haven't. Uh, You have not been making this magical brew uh, since the Crusades, you fucking liars. Uh, I'm I'm not even going to continue this. This is an uh, an insult to the intelligence of me for reading it and everybody for having to listen to it. It's marketing! It's they, lying. Essentially, what they're asked, the part Greg wanted us to read was, was the part where we basically make a float with this. So, uh, let's describe the bottle a little bit. It's, it's got, glass. It's glass. It's got uh, a bubbling cauldron of butterscotch beer in it. It's non-alcoholic, and uh, it's a, it's a gold with um, embossed uh, purple and gold lettering. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh. Uh, a quick pause if anybody is hearing uh, a little bit of tap tapping under uh, our voices. Uh, there's some pretty hard rain falling on our skylight right now. Just uh, just so you know, that's the sound you're hearing. And uh, we're going to have to twist these open because I just realized that the bottle opener is probably uh, upstairs in my room and did not make it to the podcast studio. But uh, we'll, we'll get these open with shirt tops and uh, napkins so we don't uh, tear up our hands. Uh, Eric, what does it smell like? It smells like uh, a Werther's Original. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I like butterscotch, but I remember this being very bad. Maybe I'm wrong. But <laughs> Well, uh, what's interesting is when I tried the uh, butter beer uh, at Universal, I had uh, we had sat down for a podcast with Zach uh, Thompson, who plays one of the Boneheads uh, at for Mystery Science Theater on our other podcast. And he had recently had two butter beers, and he said it was so chemical that it gave him a, uh, a migraine. Mm. So uh, we, when I went with Kate Page from the podcast and, and my girlfriend, we uh, ordered one and tried it, and they put this fake butterscotch foam on top. And I got to say... Without the foam, that would have been a superior uh, root beer. Uh, the root beer part of uh, the butter beer at Universal Studios is good. The weird butterscotch ice cream, it's not even ice cream, but foam mm. on top is the chemical part. Yeah. So uh, my recommendations is if you, if you head to a Universal Park in Florida or California, split a butter beer, you know, or if you're going to get two... Get one with the butterscotch foam and one without so you can compare if you want to try it authentically. But the root beer is a superior root beer. I actually liked it a lot. It just was ruined by the butterscotch. And uh, every other time we've tried a butterscotch uh, soda on either podcast, we've not had favorable results. No, we haven't, Uh, which is, like I said, it's odd because butterscotch is probably, I mean, that's like, I actually prefer like butterscotch syrup on ice cream to chocolate. I'm a big fan. But it's one of those things you got to take in in moderation. So, uh, cheers, yeah. guys! Down the hatch. Let's see what we think. One, two, three. Cheers. Huh? That's not bad. It's not Shut great. Up. It's not as bad as I remember it. But uh, let me. It's colder. Uh, oh, this is ice cold. Yeah. Well, the Which first nice. time we had it, we had it lukewarm, mm. and Eric, oh. uh, who was kind enough to round up these flying cauldrons. Um, iced them down so but i have a feeling as this warms up i'm going to hate it even more by the way it's the color of urine yeah it's sort of getting worse as i drink it i gotta say hmm I don't, yeah it it it's like a, a werther's original with extra sugar yeah it's that's super how i describe syrupy. it yeah i, I it, this would definitely be better with a little less sweetness to it um yeah i, I, I hate think, this i think the butterscotch part of it is actually a good butterscotch. It is. They but it's just so heavy. They and just sweet. kill it with so so much sugar. Yeah, they're they're way too much. There are good soda combinations. Like I've had a root beer that was a cream root beer, beautiful, like Americana root beer. Mm. Uh, I don't think butterscotch was meant to be a soda flavor. No, it's a topping. Yeah. 
yeah, or a candy. It, I mean, we, we tried that one out of Chicago whose name slips me at the moment, but that also was uh, quite disgusting. Yeah, this is, this is uh, it, it doesn't start off terribly disgusting, but it gets viler as you drink it. It's not chemical. No. It's just sort of a it's gross, ch- it's butter, fake butter popcorn flavor. Yeah, I, and, I, and with so much sugar. I, I've oh, given it a three sip three good sips now and, and each one got worse because the sugar just keeps getting stronger and stronger yeah do you guys have a mouth coating that's kind of gross? yeah it won't yes go away. It, it, it's sticking around it's yeah this is this is and as it sticks around oh you know this uh I'll we say, gotta rate them this is this is uh we yeah, gotta we gotta rate, gotta rate it i uh, all right i'll go two greasy wrappers it's yeah i i, I might even go lower if this doesn't Go I, away. I'm going one point five for the aftertaste. I'm 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 going with one. I'm gonna be the, the lowest on, on these flying cauldrons because A, I don't think butterscotch should be uh, a flavor uh, for sodas. B, it is so sickeningly sweet yes. that I think even kids who are sugar addicted would have a hard time finishing this. And C, the only saving grace of this is that it is cold. Yeah. I mean it, Carbonation's okay, but this is like drinking, like, you know those Torani syrups that they make Italian sodas with? Yeah, it's yeah. like drinking it straight. It's like drinking the syrup straight. It's yeah. just yeah, and the syrup, scotch yeah. syrup. An Italian soda is wonderful because the flavor is very light, but this is like drinking that syrup straight out of the bottle. Yeah, I, I need to lower my rating as because it's, it's not going away, and I, I'm starting to feel it in my stomach. I'll, I'll at least go down to a one and a half because that that's, yeah, I'm it's giving a, it a one and a half, and that's a gift. Yeah, it's I'll it's go, a, so two one and a halfs and one one greasy wrapper. Yeah. yeah, it's it's pretty bad. It's a truly magical potion because it's really going to cast a spell on our digestive systems. Uh, yeah, no doubt. It's dabbling in the dark arts. Yeah, you <laughs> know, if there really was a killing curse, I would use it on you two for that. I've I've had the soda once. And you made me do it again. Oh, Ryan, don't fly off your broom handle. Uh, uh, Avada Kedavra. Damn, it didn't work. Well, you mispronounced it. Anyway, now it's time for Greg's Tales of the Stupid. Uh, well, sure. For for my Tales of the Stupid this week, uh, earlier you mentioned uh, the Philosopher's Stone, which is, of course, the name of the first Harry Potter book. Uh, In England only, though, right? In America, it was retitled the Sorcerer's Stone because nobody knew what a Philosopher's Stone was. Yeah, it's a Sorcerer's Stone, Philosopher's Stone, same thing. Yeah. uh, There was a real-life person named Nicholas Flamel, and that's who I want to talk about today. He is mentioned as being a friend of Dumbledore's uh, in the first book and is having a uh, a stone that helped you achieve uh, immortality. And it's fascinating because sort of the height of the alchemy craze happened in the 17th century, mm-hmm. so in the 1600s. Uh, Flamel was actually a French scribe and manuscript seller, so he was more of a bookseller, and uh, he developed two centuries after his death the uh, reputation as an alchemist. Really? Yeah, no, he, you know, and uh, he and his wife... Pernella, who's also mentioned briefly in the Philosopher's Stone, uh, achieved immortality through something called the Elixir of Life. Well, couldn't you just go to their grave and see that wasn't true? Uh, well, some would well, probably contest that they were empty graves. Mm, yeah, they're they're zombie alchemists. In fact, um, uh, the, the uh, in the publisher's introduction, Flamel's search for the Philosopher's Stone was described, and um, it says that um, there was a collection of designs of higher glyphics that were in the cemetery of the uh, innocents uh, in Paris uh, that um, were commissioned by uh, Flamel, I believe for his grave, but they've long since disappeared with all of the arrangements and rearrangements uh, and passage of time. And that was that was claimed in this book that was written 200 yes. years after his death. 200 years yeah. after his death. So he, he became like, you know, just like we have legends surrounding George Washington and Paul Revere, uh, 200 years after their deaths, uh, Flamel has this legendary status at the height of um, the uh, the whole um, craze for alchemy. Did he sort of kick that off, or was it uh, just capitalizing on said craze? Uh, he it was just capitalizing on 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 the uh, craze, and in like his his name crops up in literature. You know, ever since. I mean, Isaac Newton mentioned him in his journals as the Codicus, the Dragons of Flamel. 
Um, Victor Hugo mentioned him in The Hunchback of uh, Notre Dame. Um, you know, Eric Satie was uh, fascinated with him. And, of course, J.K. Rowling uh, wrote him into mm-hmm. The Philosopher's Stone. So uh, the guy, I mean, he was, a, he was a bookseller, but he gained the reputation of being uh, a, a closet uh occultist Mm -hmm. who tapped into deeper things. You know, there's almost a cult of Leonardo da Vinci that has cropped up today and and in movies where we're we're constantly turning him into a steampunk inventor or an occultist in his own right. It's it's similar to to that. So this is really sort of like the... uh like the donation of Constantine or uh, the letter from Prester John, you know, these things that cropped up in the Middle Ages that were basically just outright hoaxes that people began taking very seriously. You know, somebody wrote it as a lark, and then it turns out, oh, everybody believes it. Well, I mean, and and that's very much human nature. You could look at uh, a modern inventor like Nikola Tesla, and he's got all kinds of legends of death rays and Mm -hmm. UFOs and alien technology surrounding him, and he's not even been dead for 100 years Well, yet. you know, I mean, part of that, too, was that Tesla actually did make weird comments about things like that from time yeah. to time while he was alive that were attested during his lifetime. And it was unclear how much was speculative uh, fiction. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, yeah, Tesla was, I mean, he was in love with a pigeon. He was a little crazy. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, he was a lot crazy, but, but know, he was I also mean, a genius. Well, yeah. But, you know, I mean, like the, the donation of Constantine or the letter from Pr- Prester John, the, the Christian king of the Orient, these were pious hoaxes uh, that uh, that people just took seriously. And but I'm assuming this is the same thing. Somebody wrote a book ascribing it to Nicholas Flamel, maybe just picking his name out of a cemetery, and uh, it just took off, I guess. I suspect it's, there was more than, than just picking his name out of a cemetery. Probably more like a theory and legend, like where there's certain pieces of truth that were pulled out, and then a whole huge story developed around we're, those. We're, we're living in glass houses because... With uh, the quick dissemination of information and the Internet, you'd think with history and scientific method and uh, skeptical thinking that we'd be immune from this today. But we have events that were live televised that are instant conspiracies. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The moon landing, 9-11. I mean, there are things that, you know, we watched happen real time Mm -hmm. that, you know, are are surrounded by conspiracies. That's true, and we have less excuse. We we, we do have less excuse. Because we do have not only the scientific method, but we have methods of seeing things happen in in pretty much real time all over the world, whereas with somebody like Flamel, uh, who am I to say that he didn't write that book 200 years after his supposed death? I'm never going to get to France it's 30 miles away, and that's a hell of a long way to walk. You know, I mean, it's uh, the communication was, you know, across distance was so difficult at that time that uh, confirming whether something was true or false was, in many cases, functionally impossible. I mean, the reason the letter from Prester John took off was he was somewhere out beyond India. Nobody in Europe was ever going to get out beyond India. <laughs> you know, uh, um, the, you know, the, the, the same thing with, uh, with this. You, there's no way to confirm or deny it in, in that kind of time period where communication uh, across distance was so uh, unreliable. Well, you know, at this point, I think we're just going to circle around on this and if we keep going. And further, I, I think we, it's time we need to move on to our Be Merry segment. And this is going to be one of the largest Be Marys uh, we've ever done. Because uh, I went uh, when I went to Honeydukes uh, uh, and bought all of these uh, trickle treats uh, that are available in the Hogwarts Express uh, sweets trolley oh. uh, oh. and uh, on uh, and and in the uh, candy shop in Hogsmeade. So we're going to try a variety of things that appear in the Harry Potter verse, starting with the classic chocolate frogs. And this box is absolutely gorgeous. It's like blue and gold it looks like it's medieval uh gothic architecture and if you've seen uh harry potter moorish really yeah but if you if you um 
if you look at uh, the way they appeared in the movies, it's actually very close to oh, what yeah. to what Harry had. I mean, this this cardboard <coughs> box is is gorgeous, and and they didn't spare any detail. Now, the thing about chocolate frogs is inside there's all supposed to be wizard cards. So I haven't opened up. Oh my gosh, there's a giant chocolate frog in here, Ryan. I'm going to hand the frog off to you and look at the wizarding card. So let's see what we have. Good God, that is a massive frog, made it, out of chocolate. It's, it's like it is made out of chocolate. It's not just coated in chocolate. I right? think it's actual chocolate. And the wizarding. Uh, what card, I'm asking is, there an actual frog in here? Because this is no. this is disturbingly lifelike. It's a disturbingly <laughs> lifelike frog. It is a well. It, it's a well-made mold. Uh, and it is com- it crunchy? Are there bones in it? It, it comes with the uh, card of uh, Hel- slightly killed Hel- Helga Hufflepuff. <laughs> Uh, who was one of the founders of one of the wizarding schools at Hogwarts. And uh, she, uh, some people claim the Hufflepuffs are massive stoners because they're really good with plants and they're very mellow and, and unaspiring. You know, no one ever fights with the Hufflepuffs. Ooh, a 3D card. Yeah, yeah, it's like a 3D card. So when you move it well, back and forth, Helga's... The old timey 80s 3D too. Yeah. <laughs> that's really yeah. cool. Well, and I mean, that's consistent with uh, the... Uh, literature as well because uh, all pictures uh, move and all photographs move in uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, Wizarding World. Yeah. So yeah. pop open that frog. Uh, let's unwrap it. That is the most disturbing <laughs> sentence you have ever said. Uh, you haven't listened to him very often. <laughs> I have. Pop open that frog. Ah! Let's eat. Let's eat some of it. Pop open that frog. <laughs> Come on. Have it hop on over here. But um, oh, it's- some some of the really some of the cards uh, that were in uh, in the uh, chocolate frog uh, includes Nicholas Flamel, uh, Albus Dumbledore, Morgan Le Fay, Ptolemy, Circe, Parcellus, Merlin. <laughs> uh, so uh, there are any number of uh, notable uh, wizarding cards. Nobody it's cares, ba- Greg. Eat their, the goddamn frog. It's their baseball cards. Well, let's see. I don't know. How do you eat a chocolate frog? I'm assuming. I'm going in, and I'm going to eat this the way you eat a chocolate uh, bunny, and I'm going to bite its head off. Ah, God damn. <laughs> For our chocolate. listeners, Greg attempted to bite most of the head off and could not get his it's teeth through. It's solid chocolate. This it's isn't solid molded. chocolate. Holy this shit. This isn't molded chocolate. This, feel that thing. That thing's a chunk. It's heavy. It's a, bite a leg that off. Is. It'll be thinner. I, I'm going to just bust a foot off. And yeah, if you can, I'd really thing. pull the tooth out on that. And when I read the back of this, this is this is just chocolate. That's yeah. all it is. It's yep. it's just decent quality milk chocolate. Decent. T- tastes no like more. tastes like an Easter Easter bunny. It's fine. Mm. It's good. Mm. What are we gonna rate this chocolate frog? Three. It's it's fine. It's not blow your socks off chocolate. It's uh, it's. I wouldn't even say it necessarily rises to the level of Hershey bar quality chocolate. It's just chocolate. Shaped like a no, frog. I, I think with the Hershey, you get a little bit of that. Um, I don't know. It, it tastes cheaper. This, this, it, well, it doesn't seem exceptional. I would actually put it a hair above a Hershey bar. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I still think it's, you know, it's all, maybe. I mean, it's chocolate, it's chocolate's good. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I'm still going to call it a three and a half. Yeah. Greasy wrappers for me. It, it's decent, but. Yeah, I mean, Nothing any chocolate is pretty much good chocolate, but I've had chocolate that... Uh, no, this, the stuff I that's mean, full of wax is not good. You know, I've, I've had chocolate that is literally uh, uh, transformative. And, and, yeah, yeah. It affects your brain in, in certain ways, and really good chocolate can actually give you an emotional reaction. Well, I will say this, that this chocolate is socially responsible. They didn't use palm oil, so they didn't... Uh, well, they had better start fucking using palm oil. And being socially irresponsible because that makes better chocolate. Uh, and they also uh, use sustainable cocoa farming. So I guess no child uh, slavery, ironically, being used on a children's product uh, for a children's Yeah, literature. you know, I can't really say that they need to use child slavery to make better chocolate. So. so I'm willing to take some so-so chocolate if it means children aren't being enslaved, which is a real problem with a lot of big chocolate companies. Yeah. So uh, I'm Not gonna... enslaved as in they don't work for much. Enslaved as in they don't work for anything. They are slaves. They work so that they can get fed so they can live another day. They, 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 are, they aren't allowed to leave. 
And they work for no pay. That is the definition of slavery. So, so um, we're going to next try some uh, fudge flies. Oh, this keeps getting better. And so these are chocolate flavored uh, fudge flies, and it comes in chocolate flavored chocolate flavored fudge flies. And uh, yeah. this is uh, going to be interesting. We'll see what it. T- oh, this one is made with palm oil. Oh, honey dukes, you're letting us down. The chocolate frogs, no palm oil, fudge flies. Oh, they're just like little pressed, uh, looks like flies, you know. Not quite as graphically well done as the frog, thankfully. I I, I wouldn't care if they were done as well. They'd actually the frog was a little disconcerting to look at. They'd have to be much smaller to be real fly size. These are like gigantic flies. Yeah, horse flies. Yeah, yeah. These these are like horse flies. So it tastes like mediocre frosting. I would rather have mediocre frosting. Oh, that, that, no, that is awful. Yeah, it's not great. What did they? It's 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 just like eating really bad frosting. It's gritty. Yeah. It's got. It tastes like yeah. It tastes like they're made in half with Crisco, with a little chocolate in them. Yeah. It's oh. got this weird t- combination of grittiness yeah. and sliminess. Yeah, that is cho- awful. Now, the chocolate frog, I'm going to go ahead and, and give it a four and a half for really? the flavor. Because it's it's just like eating an Easter bunny chocolate. It's, you know, it's decent. It's also, um, they're socially responsible. Uh, this one. It doesn't make it taste this one, That is no better than mediocre chocolate. Nah, yeah. but the fudge flies get a one. Fudge flies buzz right down to one because uh, I mean, I'd give them maybe a one point five. I'm but. I'm at the one. Fudge flies are terrible. I mean, they're, and one is being generous. They're mentioned the the fudge flies are mentioned in Prisoner of Azkaban. They are just not good. There's just no way to put it as as they just. I think aren't. it's really the texture more than anything else that just makes them really unpleasant. It's like it. it it's, the flavor is not great, but it's not horrendous. But that texture just makes it seem gross. So if someone tried to sell you on a special treat, and got some Crisco and put a little cocoa powder in it, and some sugar and hobo mixed jizz it, and and mixed it up on a spoon, that's what a fudge fly would be. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's it's the texture is really. It's I, hard to describe. I, I, I'm really looking forward to having something else to get a different flavor in my mouth. Though I, I do want to say, let's let's uh, make that hard candy the last thing we try. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Because well, is it lemon drops? Because that might help cut some of the sweet flavor. So yeah, it ought to be the last thing. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's okay. Push we're lemon drops. Well, let's, this we'll, 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 this. we'll skip over the sherbet lemons, and we'll go to Clippy's Clip Joint Clippings. Uh, and these are, um, it's a little hard to describe, but uh, it's basically licorice hair. Oh, for the love of Christ, it's, Greg. Licorice. Is lic- there anything that isn't horrifying? No, I mean, you think that's horrifying. That's what it's is processed on. This is an actual display at Honeydukes, and it is an automaton uh, that shoots out uh, licorice hair and that is clipped by house elves. From his head, please God, from, from his head. Right. Yeah, hopefully from as, his head. As these two were talking, I just uh, cut open this package. Because to be quite mm. crass, this does look like a package wad of giant pubic hair. And it, it, it was also yeah, mentioned it in- It smells like a really good licorice. licorice. Like an actual it licorice. Smells, I mean, it's it, pretty it, strong. It's, it's, it's not, kinda, it's not yeah. gonna be garbage like that licorice pipes, I don't think. I think this is gonna be yeah. actual licorice where if I'm, I'm gonna I'm be forced to eat licorice, uh, I'm gonna want. Oh my to, goodness! This thing it's, like, it's all hair. That's a long strand of I, hair. I, yeah, I I went and I pulled one piece and it ended up just I like pulled out like three feet of this stuff. Yeah, oh, I got a decent sized. Yeah, it piece. smells it <laughs> smells like anise or licorice. So I'm not a huge black licorice fan to begin with. So I I, t- I do like black licorice. Let's I'm let's let's give it a try. Yeah. Mm. Got licorice texture. A nice texture, huh? It's got a solid mm-hmm. licorice flavor. Mm-hmm. No, that's strong. You know what? I mean, so much that's licorice. A nice, this is actually pretty good. There's, there's, yeah. It's this not is, that fake black licorice flavor. Exactly. There's no, no. bite to it. There's a little bite to this. I, I just mean, a light. red vines, but, things like that. Um, I don't care for it because they just don't taste like anything. But, you know, when we say drink a really good root beer mm-hmm. that has a licorice undertone, like mm-hmm. a Tommy Knocker's root beer, I'm actually having uh, licorice and fennel and anise kind of grow on me. Mm-hmm. This is good. 
This is strong. It mm. actually tastes like something. There's 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 mm. a kick to it. There's an odd kick to it that you don't expect. With I, candy I get because the, it's real. Uh, the fennel and the, the anise are definitely there in this, mm -hmm. and it, sort of it is your it is. This is really good. This yeah. is a, this is an outstanding licorice. I don't like black licorice. Um, five. Five, yes, absolutely a five. I, am, I guess I don't like black licorice because I've never had real black licorice. I've I'm, had some cheap ass. I'm pretty picky about my black licorice, but good black licorice is amazing. This is amazing. Yeah. yeah. It really, wow. It's it's it clears your sinuses. There's, there's some kick to this. Hmm. Now, the next one is kind of like Ryan's Volcanoes. Because uh, it's going to be very variable. These are Bernie Bots Every Flavor Beans. And uh, now you can get these from Jelly Belly in pretty boring packages, almost at convenience stores. But this is the Honey Dukes uh, version of it. So it comes in almost a circus tent-like old-timey packaging to match uh, the movies. And the thing is, we could, you know, be eating peach. We could be eating earwax. It is a total gamble of what we're going to be eating. Oh, well, fuck you for this, Greg. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So depending on what you get, I mean, it, it, uh, it, it can include flavors like grass, farm dirt, vomit, earwax, paper, and bogeys, which are okay. boogers. If I uh, spit this across the room, you're going to have to clean it up. I, I take no responsibility. Okay. Huh? Well, the, You're the, introducing non-food flavors like vomit into my life. You deal with the consequences. <laughs> so, I mean, and the famous quote is like uh, when... Uh, Dumbledore is uh, sitting with Harry uh, in the infirmary because Harry's just had one of his many beatdowns, and um, he thinks he's getting a nice, safe toffee, but alas, he gets earwax. So uh, we need to open this up. Can you uh, do the honors there, Eric? Some of the flavors uh, in uh, the Every Flavor Beans include almond, apple, aubergine, which is eggplant, bacon, baked beans, banana, Belly button lint, beef casserole, black pepper, bogies, bouillabaisse, broccoli, bubblegum, buttered popcorn, cauliflower, cheese, cherry, chicken, chili. Why would anybody dirt, do this to themselves? Lemon, liver, mustard, onion, overcooked cabbage, uh, spinach, sprouts, strawberries, tripe, sugared violets, toast, toffee, vomit, and troll bogies. So, and then what? they actually have. <laughs> Uh, a color code here of what some of them might look like. All right, like. here's here's my question. To say we've had these, how many do we have to have? I'm having one. I think one is safe, and if you get a bad one, you get to try again if you want to get a good one. If I get a bad one, I'm just I'm just going to take it out on you. Okay. Yeah, I... I out of fairness, okay, I picked... Oh, it might be a nice lemon one. It's sort of lemon colored. Okay, I'll bite into this first. Here we go. I've got I've got a bright red one. I see peppermint as one potential. Oh, that's nasty. <laughs> All right. It smells okay. I think I got earwax. I got peppermint. That was horrible. Mm. Mm. I got some sort of fruity thing. I got a peppermint one. It is absolutely delicious. So it backfired on me. I think this is like, mm. I'm not sure what this is. Apple. This is apple. This is good. Yeah. Mine was earwax. Mm. This is wonderful. Mm -hmm. This is horrible. Mm -hmm. I hate you both. Why did you make me do this? <laughs> <laughs> but this is, Only fitting. This, this is, is actually, the apple thing is good, but it's just really wonderful to see Greg hoist by his own petard. Totally. Yeah. I have been wily coyotied by myself. Because I know that he has been waiting for weeks to push these on me, hoping I would get like a vomit flavored. Oh. And I got a nice, refreshing apple flavor. I got a beautiful peppermint. <laughs> oh, man, at least I have some empathy with Dumbledore. Yeah. All right, you guys feeling brave? You want to do it one more time? Or no, are you, are no, you feeling no, lucky? no, no. Why would I, I do well, that to myself? <laughs> no. All right, I'm going in for one more because I, I was dissatisfying. Oh, look, that's a nice green-colored one, green and mottled Could be black. Like, uh, watermelon? Like vomit. <laughs> Something fruit. I think it's watermelon. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought it might be, just by the color scheme, yeah. sort of green. It's not bad. There's a little bit of red there. Even huh? though it's a, quote, safe flavor, not crazy about it. we got to rate these. Well, based well, on the apple, I'd give it like a four, because that was really actually a very, very strong apple flavor. It was really good. The peppermint had a nice refreshingness to it. I give that the peppermint flavor a four and a half. Yeah, and there was even like a little bit of natural apple flavor to it. It seemed like they used some sort of real apple in. The, they probably didn't, but it tasted like it. It didn't taste like, like fake apple. 
Um, I've got to do a rating system that is complete variable that is rated one through five because I've just had a one and probably a four, and I imagine if I kept eating these, I would hit every single probably note yeah. on the scale. Why don't you do that, Greg? This is Keep gonna, this is a one. Go for it, Greg. You love stuffing no, your face. No, no, no. This is this is a one through five for me because <laughs> I, know, I know it's going to be bad. Well, you made us uh, move the hard candy to the end, and uh, this is actually a Muggle candy that uh, Albus Dumbledore is quite fond of, and this is Sherbert Lemon. And he was eating these uh, when, uh, in the first book, on the first few pages, when Harry was being dropped off at the Dursleys after Voldemort attacked and killed his parents. And uh, for a while, Sherbert Lemon was one of the passwords to Dumbledore's office, you know, back in 1992. So we would call these lemon drops. It's just a hard, slightly fizzy, lemony, uh, muggle oh, sweet. Huge. That is, yeah, that is a ma- that's a massive lemon drop. That's like the size of a small lemon. Good God! How are you supposed to eat this thing? You just suck on it, man. Or just, it just takes your whole mouth. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's got the you know like every other uh, lemon drop I've ever had. By the way, this comes in a really attractive pink and green striped tin with a little window. So this is this will be a, a nice uh, pin jar or something when it's all done. But um, you know, like most lemon drops, it's rough texture and, yeah. and it'll it'll have a smooth center. Once. But it's about twice the size of your average lemon drop, I'd say. Yeah, an American yeah. lemon drop is is about the size of a, a jelly bean. This is the size of a robin's egg. <laughs> it's pretty goddamn yeah. big. Yeah, yeah. count yeah. of three. Let's try them, guys. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Oh, that's delicious. It's huge. It's very good, but it's mm-hmm. an inconvenient candy. It is. I don't like the size. It makes it really hard to talk. Yep, and you can't smuggle. Uh, a, you can't just on the down low have one of these because people are going to be able to see that you've got something yeah. gigantic in your mouth. And it's amazing yep. that nowhere on this does it say choking hazard for small children. <laughs> this is could, a choking hazard for anybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm taking this out of my mouth in a minute because I'm actually a little nervous having something this large stuck in like the side of my cheek. Hmm. Mm-hmm. There's so many places I could go with that yeah. comment, but I'm not going to touch it. Oh, feel free. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to talk with this in your mouth. Um, yeah, in fact, I'm up. Mm. I'm getting rid of this. I can't even it's, talk about it and rate it with it in my mouth. I'm All chewing right, mine the, up. The flavor, the flavor I'm absolutely for. It's really great. I think if I needed to eat more of these, I would... Like take a hammer to them and crush them into bits and eat them in little little pieces at a time. Yeah, the flavor's great, but it's um, it's too big. It's not. Yeah, it's not an efficient candy delivery m- mechanism because it's just it's, so big. I, I would actually say that the flavor of this, if it were purely based on flavor, this would be a five. Oh yeah, it yeah. was that good. But I have to knock it down. It's it's I'm gonna call it four and a half greasy wrappers because mm-hmm. it's just a inconvenient form. Now, imagine really trying annoying. to shove a lemon-flavored golf ball into your mouth, and you will get about the idea. Yeah. Slight, like slightly pong. small. Yeah, ping pong well, It's smaller, ping but it doesn't ball. feel smaller once you're trying to like, <laughs> find a way to, to actually eat it without choking on it. But um, I chomped on mine, and it was very easy to crunch up. So the initial largeness of the uh, lemon uh, sherbet, the sherbet lemon dissipated very quickly because um, when I eat lemon drops, I, I, I like to chomp them. I don't like to, to just leave them in my mouth and suck on them for an hour. So, no, well, it's because you're a heathen. I am yeah. a heathen. So uh, I, I, I got to give, I got to give this a five greasy wrappers. I, I, it's a solid candy. It may be the best of all the stuff that we tried, that and, and the uh, Clippy's clip joint. Uh, I gotta clipping. go with a three because the size to me is just so inconvenient that it knocks it down. Wow, that's a huge knock from the size, but. Uh, I, I have to go with that. I mean, it would yeah. be a five oh, just based on flavor, but this size is ludicrous. It's it's ludicrous and it's actually actively dangerous to have a hard candy dangerous. this big. Yeah, it is it's dangerous. irresponsible. That's why I'm knocking it down so much. I, 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 and I could see a kid I, choking. I, yeah, I think this that, is actually an irresponsibly made candy. That's that's how I, dangerous <clears throat> this is. This is right up there with those Kinder eggs that Germany makes that have been banned from the states because hmm. they've got tiny chokeable toys inside the chocolate. Yeah, but the toys oh, are yeah. awesome. The toys are awesome. <laughs> yeah. But they are a tremendous hazard. It's an irresponsible thing to, to do. So. 
All right. Well, I think it's time to sum up. So we started out with a shepherd's, or in this case, it was beef, so cottage pie. It was really well done. Uh, I think we, uh, Greg and I really liked it, and Ryan liked it except for the fact that it had peas in it. Well, yeah, I mean, that really? ruined it for yeah. me, but I gave yeah. it a five in principle because I recognized that it was a good food. That, that was just my bias. Right. Uh, we then moved on to a not very good butterscotch beer that continues to get worse the more you drink it. It's it, uh, it, it actually sort of getting worse just sitting here. I, I can feel it staring at me. <laughs> that's kind of creepy. It doesn't even have eyes, and you, you still see it yeah. looking at you. Yeah. That is, you're, wow. I really wish you hadn't pointed that out to yeah. me. Uh, and then we moved on to uh, several sweet treats. Uh, yeah, we had the uh, l- clippings that are supposed to look like hair that are some wonderful licorice. Uh, uh, we had some Bernie Botts bees, beans that, uh, at least as far as Ryan are concerned, are all delicious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> horrible. Uh, uh, horrible, uh, I say. No, what was, what, was was horrible, or what was horrible were the fudge flies. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we're all yeah, in agreement. Absolutely. The chocolate fry was okay. The fudge flies were terrible. Yep. Sherman Sherbert lemon tasted great, but was a choking hazard. Absolutely agreed. But the licorice oh. is, is fantastic. So, uh, got any final thoughts, Greg? I am so full of magical eats, Eric. I just need to sit for a spell and digest. Avena Kedavra. Why won't this work for me? That's a leaky Sharpie, Ryan, not a wand, and you just stained your shirt. At least it's Magic Shop Disappearing Ink. No, that's just regular ink. Your your shirt is ruined. But cheer up, Ryan. As J.K. Rowling wrote, happiness can be found even in the darkest of times if one only remembers to turn on the light. Well, that's just objectively untrue. Well, thank you for joining us on Junk Mouth. Until next time, remember, eat, drink, don't listen to Ryan, and be merry. All right, let's go round up some virgins. Come on. All right. (laughs) Yay! For volcano purposes. <laughs> <laughs>